Welcome to the Basketball and Brew podcast, produced by Jude McLaren, and I am your host, Dan Miller. Thank you for joining us for this week's podcast, and please help us out by subscribing to our podcast on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you are watching, and please give us a follow on Twitter. Tonight's podcast is brought to you by our sponsors, both right here in beautiful San Marcos, Texas. Pie Society is an excellent stop in San Marcos for great New York-style pizzas made with the freshest ingredients, local beers on tap, and an overall fun and cool vibe. And come into Zelix Ice House. Zelix has a great happy hour drink special, outside patio, and a great time and a great vibe to hang out with friends. Tonight, we are extremely excited to welcome a world champion, Natalie Nicasse, to the podcast. After an outstanding high school playing career at Marina High School in Southern California, Natalie was a three-year starting point guard at UCLA, earning Pac-10 All-Conference honors. Natalie went on to have a professional playing career, both right here in the United States and overseas, before coaching in Germany, Japan, with the Los Angeles Clippers, in the G League, and on the bench in the NBA with the NBA Los Angeles Clippers, and most recently as the first assistant to the 2022 world champion Las Vegas Aces. Coach Nakase, thank you for coming on Basketball and Brew. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk hoop. So. Coach, I'm, I'm all kinds of pumped to talk hoop and talk about your offense with the Aces and, and some pick and roll. And before we do any of that, I just got to ask, first say congratulations on the world championship. And have you had time to just reflect and celebrate and just take it all in? <laughs> I mean, still celebrating. You know, it's been yep. a week. Uh, we went hard right away, right after the game, on the plane ride, <laughs> in the parade. Um, so it was, you know, good to be around the fans and be around the local people. But I still yeah. got... You know, family to go home to and probably another celebration continues so yeah yeah just enjoy it all you know not many people can say world champions and it was so so fun to watch coach just I know you had the best seat in the house right there and you're coaching and doing busy but just seeing it on tv and just a very talented team coach but what what made this group so special that that you got it all the way done and, and you won the championship I mean, there's so many things, but I think the top of the list is just goes down to, you know, genuine leadership. I mean, from, you know, Mark Davis, our owner, who believes in women, women in sports, um, from Nikki Fargus, uh, pretty much a huge reason why I came, just, you know, wants to empower women and make it more, you know, visible. And then Becky Hammond, I mean, you know, I didn't know her coming in, but then just instantly kind of connecting with her and her just being genuine and just real. And I think, you know, doing something, winning a championship in six months, five months, I think, um, not knowing each other. I think it just shows like her leadership, her passion to, you know, want to really genuinely meet and understand and get close to our players. And then at the end of the day, you know, she has one of the best basketball minds. So, yeah, it starts from the top. Right, right. Wow. And it, it was great to see a coach as, as you guys progress. I got to ask you about that f first phone call or meeting with coach when she asked you to join her staff. Like, how was that? And, and can you take us through that? Yeah, I could take you through it. Um, you know, I ha we had a mutual friend and she just mm -hmm. said, you know, give her a call. You know, you, you you'll actually see that you guys are a lot similar than you think. And yeah, sure enough, our first phone call, like we could not get off the phone. Like it was going back and forth with you know, being, you know, being small point guards, right? Mm -hmm. And just being mm -hmm. undersized, being, you know, counted out just from everything from uh, being too small to play Division One, to play in the pros, and then obviously in the NBA, just, you know, being doubted a lot. And so, you know, just going through those experiences and like saying, oh my God, that's what happened to me. That's what happened. Like, you know, we just bonded instantly. And then it kind of connected us with, hey, let's, let's do this together. You know, right. um, I was completely on board when we started talking like playoff adjustments, like we were just going back and forth because we watched each other's teams, right. you know, so right. then we'd have questions like, oh, why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? And then I just we could, could, couldn't stop talking about basketball enough. So that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's awesome. And when you have a, a championship run like yours, coach, and you're with a new team, new staff, but a lot of these players are together and now you, you have to get them over the, top, over the top. Can I ask, how much did you as coaches mention the word championship, talk playoffs during the regular season? Or, you know, I know Becky's real process driven, but just curious if you guys openly talked about that throughout the year with your team. The word championship wasn't used a lot um, just because we knew we had a long ways to go, right? And right. we kind of learned just from 
coaching experiences, like you don't want to ever like over say the word championship and say we are the top team until like we actually earned it and we've gotten to a point where we knew and we felt we were. So it was more, Becky's mantra was more like, hey, let's build championship habits. So it was every day we had to get better, right? Like this team wasn't championship right. ready right. when we picked them up. And so um, it was more like day to day, like what are we doing? And it was actually like, let's get better every single day. Championship habits mean being disciplined, um, being really physical on defense because we were smaller than most teams. We went small ball um, mm -hmm. and then moving mm -hmm. Asia to the five, obviously. So we had to be a gritty team. So it was more habits, championship habits, but the word championship never really was like thrown, you know, too much. And, you know, it keeps them humble. It keeps them, keeps them hungry. And so I think that's what Becky really wanted to really strive for was that type of mindset of like, we haven't done anything yet. You know, we still have a lot to right. prove. So, right. Right. That makes sense. And as you're going through the regular season coach and you have such great players, just blending them together under the new regime. Can I ask coach, was it a smooth, easy transition? Like week one, you're like, we got this. Or was it just all throughout the season, kind of a building step? Cause by the end of the year, you guys looked like you had been together a long time, you know? Yeah. And that's Becky's specialty, you know, is the buy-in. Um, mm -hmm. And I, that's when I go back to genuine, genuine leadership. Like she's genuinely like, I want to make you guys better, but I want to make sure you guys come together um, when it comes to playoff times. But no, it, it was tough. It was rocky. I mean, for these, you know, all stars and very talented players, they had to come into training camp with who was going to start, you know, who was going to get the shots, right. who was going to get the minutes. But um, so they had a lot to prove themselves and they were in competition as well. And of course, like they're competitors, you know, so why wouldn't they? But it was just all about communication every day, Becky you know, lay down the law of like what your role is going to be and how we're going to play. And she always stressed like we have to play together. We have to play together. That was going on all the time because when it comes to playoffs and you play a team five times, you cannot be selfish because if you're selfish, you're easily guarded. So she always would say like if you see two, pass it. So mm -hmm. meaning if you see mm -hmm. two, two defenders, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, the 12th man, the 11th man, the 6th man, like you're making that pass and they're going to get that open shot over, you know, our top score. And once, you know, we did that and, you know, the first 10 games, I mean, we we're playing at such a fast pace and with space that like we ended up beating teams, you know, a little bit more selfish than we would like. And so once we started getting, you know, closer to like other opponents because they had scout us, then we really had to make sure we moved that ball, you know, then we, right. we became unguardable, you know. Right. And coach, I love that, you know, C2 pass it. You got one attack. Um, can I ask about your spacing coach? You do have great spacing and obviously you play with great pace leading the league in scoring. What is some things in practice you do, even I know it's such a high level and a lot of our listeners aren't at the WNBA level, maybe more high school and college coaches, but what do you do to teach that great spacing that you guys play with to allow your scorers space to score the basketball? Well, the main thing we did was move Asia to the five, right? Mm -hmm. And then during, before these players came in, I, you know, I, I, I was there like a month early. And so Becky was really stressing, like, yo, we want Asia to shoot threes. We want one through five shooting threes. So that was the biggest thing is getting them comfortable to be out there because Asia right. only shot one three the season before. So that was a huge, you know, transition and a huge, you know, credit to her work ethic of getting outside that you know, three-point line knocking shots down. And so it's all about, number one, introducing the three-point line to them. And then number two, like in training camp, a lot of NBA teams do this. And, you know, any level, high school, high school, college doesn't matter. Put, we would put X's in the deep corners um, right. to make sure that they stress, like they have to get there. It's not just the corner, it's the deep corners. And then obviously the, the quadrants uh, we also use, like, it's kind of like in like the slot area um, yep. or even lower, like depending on what you guys prefer. But we would put marks on the floor so they understand like you have to be in these four spots. If not, like if you're inside that three, you're basically defending yourself. So um, it took a lot. I mean, a, a huge change for the girls from last year because they were used to like a, a, just a regular five, you know, the post up. We didn't do a lot of posting. Um, which also, you know, Asia had to adapt to, which she did great. She played more at the elbows and like mid post. And then, um, you know, just again, harping on it with film and then just calling them out throughout training camp. So it was a process, right. you know, right. 
Right. I, I, I love that coach. And I like what you just said there too. Like if you're inside that three point line, you're basically defending yourself. We, we say a term I heard got, I got from Brad Stevens one time is when running to those deep corners, we have boxes cause there's a line there. So we say, get to, get to your boxes. Once you cross the, cross the T. Um, I love that coach. And can I ask about the, the, the stars on your team? Because just having such a, a roster, you know, with Chelsea and, and, and Kelsey Plum and obviously Asia just, is it hard to get them to buy into such a team basketball? Because I know they definitely all did their share of scoring and, and had to make the plays. But I, when I look at your team, I, one of the things I just enjoy, because I even I told our guys to watch, I said, they are such a team's team, you yeah. know, when rolling through those playoffs. Or are those stars just buy right into that? Uh, no. <laughs> no. <I> mean, <laughs> it's not that easy. I mean, they, of course, would probably – they think they would – they think they do based off of their experience. But this is, you know, if you haven't won a championship, then what experience are you going off of? So, right. you know, right. Becky sat them down, like I mentioned, you know, in terms of what their roles are. But, you know, we all asked them, like, what do you, what do you guys want to do? Like, first right. you have to ask them, like, what are you guys willing to sacrifice, you know, if you're willing, if you want to win a championship? And when they yep. said, hey, right. we're all here to win a championship, and you verbally have to, like, get that commitment, right? You have to hear yep. it. Um, and then once that was said like, no, we'll, we'll do whatever it takes. And then that's when the roles have to, you know, be, be established. And again, it's communication every day. Now, do these girls go away from their roles? Of course, like, of right. course they want 20, they want 25, <laughs> they want a double, double, they want a triple, double, like, you know, it's just natural competitiveness of being great at, you know, what they do. And so that's when like, we realize, you know, some players can't always have that high number. Like we have to average like at least 20 plus assists. And it had to come from everyone and not just one player. And so, again, it was constantly, like, holding them accountable. Like, right. it was every game. It was every practice. You know, we'd watch film and just be like, look, like, Becky would always say, like, we're not going to win like this, you guys. Like, you're, you're talented and, you know, you guys are scoring at will. But the, her biggest thing, too, was, like, not shooting contested shots. Because, um, yes, can they make it? Of course. I mean, Chelsea Gray, she knocks those down, right. like. Yeah you know, at will, but at the end of the day, she ne still needed to average like six, seven, eight assists on top of that. And so to me, it was um, a lot of film breakdown, um, a lot of holding them accountable. And again, especially on tough moments when they felt good, you know, <laughs> like right. they felt yeah. good, like they were rolling. But um, yeah, it was, it was every game and it was a process. But again, give credit to the whole buy-in thing of going back yeah. to what is our goal? And it's to win a championship. Now, if they said, Hey, I'd rather get my stats. Well, then now you're on the wrong team. <laughs> so, yeah, but yeah, you know, right. luckily they never they never said that. And um, right, you know, right. obviously give credit to them for accepting their role. You know, right, and and give credit to you guys as a coaching staff. You did a phenomenal job, and that good to great passing for shots was just evident. Watching the quality of shots you guys got, and with the pace, just such a fun offensive team to study. Coach, can I ask about a film session in the WNBA? Uh, the game is on a, a Wednesday night. The next day you have the team in for a, a film session. Could you kind of walk the audience through what that might look like? Well, it kind of depends. There's a lot of things that, you know, we sure. didn't treat every team the same. Um, mm -hmm. It all kind of depended on, you know, where they stood, what they were good at. Um, but normally, like, a film session is, I'd say probably an average between five to ten minutes. Like, Becky mm -hmm. is really this is where, again, she's just a master of, is just keeping things simple and clear. Like, she always wanted, so we would have to kind of make sure we discuss it with her on, you know, because all the assistant coaches would break down and have their scouts. And then from there, uh, we would have to introduce it to Becky. And so we would go over it, and then she would allow us to break it down. But it usually ended up being like five to ten minutes, um, just really clear with what their strengths are and then how we're going to defend it. Um, and then again, be ready for any questions, but the basic of it, of what she really liked is keeping it simple. She's like, you don't want to overdo it. And that at the end of the day, defensively, that try hard factor has to be the number one. Like you could have like the best schemes in the world, right? Like you could say with, we had with Stewie, like we had a lot of different coverages for her, but at the end of the day, like she's like the Katie of the WNBA. So like, you have to, at the end of the day, just try harder than her. Like, you really have to make sure you right, try right. as hard as you can to make every shot contested. And, you know, and the schemes may work or may not work, and then you just got to make sure you communicate it out. So, you know, keeping it simple versus those um, sessions. And also keeping it interesting, right? Like, yeah. I mean, you've watched film. I watched film as a player. Like, I was 
I mean, sorry, but sometimes they're boring. <laughs> so, yeah, like, right. Um, I think we did a good job as coaches, like, to keep it interesting, to make some jokes in there, to show some highlights. Like, we knew what, you know, after, like, I would say about 15 games, what they like to watch. So you got to make sure you're creative at the same time. So that was right. Part of it. Yeah. Right. And coach, can you give me one example of that? Did you like just yeah. something like maybe you cut out of the player that was kind of funny to start a film session or end a film session? Is there anything in particular? Uh, God, you put me on the spot. Um, you know, you know, Becky had this phrase just in terms of how we protect the paint. I'm not, I'm not going to, sh- I just want to keep it in house, but she had a sure. phrase for us to, you know, we yep. had to protect the paint. We didn't allow a lot of um, paint points because that was huge because we're small. Yep. And so at the end of like some of our video sessions, I would just show a couple of the girls, whether they're, you know, Chelsea was taking a charge or Asia was getting blocks, Kia was getting blocks or whoever, mm-hmm. you know, did a great job either the game before or the game after and just show like a slight like highlight of them just, just dominating the inside, you know, and just yeah. like protecting the rim and just, you know, they got a kick out of it and understanding like, they are capable of doing this like every night. And so just right. to, again, right. like say like, yo, this is not a fluke. Like this is how we protect the paint. Um, yeah. I just threw that in there. And then when the playoffs hit, like we had a really great, we have a very great um, videographer slash PR. Mm-hmm. He's, he's like the guy he, he really put in a lot of very creative um, playoff of uh, highlight film sessions that really like motivated us. So that I'm going to keep it with Chris. Chris is going to have right. to talk about that if you want to ask right. him, but. Yeah, but right. that stuff it helps, you know. Yeah, it definitely helps. absolutely. Yeah. And, and coach, kind of staying with that that theme of fun because I, I don't know. I find in basketball it is a long season. You know, it's a grind for the guys, for coaches. We all love it so much. But it, right. to kind of keep it fresh, you got to have fun. And I find the most successful teams they have fun with each other, whether it's on the bus, planes, and your incidents. Is, right. is that something that Becky and you you kind of stress? You know, with with the ladies, like like we're still going to have fun. Oh yeah, for sure. Like not. Again, not knowing really kind of who sh- who she is, a coach, her personality. Like Becky likes to have a ton of fun, like yeah. just playing yeah. music. She likes to sing. She yeah. likes to dance. So our shoot arounds are always like, I, it looks like like a like a dance off or like it looks yeah. like you know like I we're in love a club. It. Like I couldn't believe you know I'm coming from just my my background. I'm I'm kind of more serious. I like to have that like focus type, but. Mm-hmm. Becky has taught me, and I'm so glad, like, I got to experience this firsthand, like, how you just got to have fun. Like, the girls right. got to come in. They got to want to come and, you know, step on that court. So we'd always play music, and then all of a sudden, they're just dropping like it's hot or just, like, <laughs> you know, they're singing along. And right. then some songs right. are like, oh, play this song. And then sometimes, like, no, don't play that song. Like, it just, you know, we're always having a good time. And that's crucial because, you know, it's a grind, a day-to-day grind. Yes. Like, we don't take – we took very little days off. I mean, I could – probably go like this this is how many days off we probably had like wow. throughout the season and so right. again you want to show up you want to have a good time with your family and you know the more we had fun the better and so yes so all to all coaches yeah. play music yeah. have fun joke around like you know don't take things too seriously that's the yep. biggest thing yeah yep. I love it, coach. And it was evident too, just in your celebrations, how much everyone loved each other, you know, and just when it, when it's so rewarding, when you do get to to ultimately win a championship with your teammates, coach, can I I want to switch gears a little bit and just talk about your time overseas, Uh, you know, getting to be in Germany and Japan. Uh, Did you, I mean, obviously you learned things coaching there and and, and playing. I just wanted to see for, I guess my first question is this, what is the hardest thing when you go overseas and what's a great thing when you go overseas that you kind of took from that experience? Kind of a loaded question, but just curious about that part first. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure with a lot of people who experience overseas, I mean, my first time especially was just just being away from your family, you know, just being like literally isolated, lonely. I mean, my first year, we didn't have like this great internet, you know, like I didn't have a phone. Like I just remember going over there and like some random gentleman who was the president like I didn't know he just picked me up he barely spoke English I had a translator also pick me up and you know I'm going to the hotel and I'm like where am I going um where am I staying who am I staying? like this is right. all unknown and so a little bit of you know anxiety fear factor going in the whole thing but mm-hmm. I would say the first couple of weeks of not really knowing anyone and you're just thrown in a country and not being able to communicate was um, just the loneliness, like you're right. you're by yourself a lot. Um, but luckily, I had great teammates and great organizations that took care of it. Um, and then once you get adjusted, like 
you get paid to play basketball living in a different right. country. I mean, who, not very many people could say that. And once I, you know, got adjusted and I absorbed the whole, you know, country and culture, like, I just thought that this was unreal. Like, this was, you know, probably going to be the, one of the best experiences of my life, which it was. Um, mm -hmm. And then I just got to explore, like, on off days, I would go to the cities like Berlin, uh, mm -hmm. Munich, uh, Frankfurt, like, you name it, Cologne. And I just got to sightsee. And then after a season, I went to Paris, I went to Barcelona, I went to you know, Malta Islands, like, um, you know, I just took advantage of it. And like, I just can't express like how much that taught me. And it also taught me how to be like really independent, you know, right. not to rely right. on a lot of things that were so accessible in the States. And I think that kind of introduced me to the NBA because in the NBA, like you're on the road so much. Like if you talk to any of these NBA guys, you know, they were like, oh, once I'm done, I'm not going to coach because like you give up so much time from your family so you learn how to be by yourself and so I think I almost trained myself overseas and then when I was in the NBA like you're alone all the time and so right. I right. think that definitely helped me you know so it's kind of blessing in disguise right wow and and coach with with the saying that too if, if a player gets an opportunity to go overseas go take advantage because you know it's so hard to play in the nba and wnba there's only so many spots but there's a lot of pros out there you know a lot yeah. of professionals and oh, yeah. you know yeah so we we had a player where i coached at laterno university who has a chance and he's playing overseas now from a division three and he was division three player of the year and he's loving that experience being overseas so yeah. just love it love to hear it Coach, um, I, staying with that, though, when then when you became the head coach in, in Germany and coached in Japan, how did that help you then as an assistant coach with the Clippers, that experience that you gained from being over there overseas? Just understanding how much it takes, you know, to mm -hmm. be the head coach. Um, there's a lot of uh, pressure. There's a lot of responsibility. Uh, you're managing everyone. Um, you're right. managing the whole team. You're managing you know, overseas is a little different. Your front office is a little bit smaller. Um, and, but you're just, um, you're managing everybody. You're like basically the CEO of a, of a team. And right. so yeah. what I learned is how can I, as an assistant, like how can I make the head coach's life easier, right? Like how can I lighten her load or his load, like whatever that is. So I would just constantly, like, especially with the Clippers, with Doc and T. Lou, I would just ask them like once a week, like, is there anything you need? Is there anything that, you know, I could take off your plate or um, I could just let you know what's going on just in terms of, you know, what's going on each week? Because every week is different, especially when right. you win, especially when you lose. I mean, here comes all the questions from the media. I mean, it's just, you know, and for me, like once I got in with the Clippers and observing, you know, just, you know, right then and there, like what they go through every single day just from being in our meetings, I'm like, Man, that's stressful, you know, because at the end yeah, of the day, yeah. when a team says, oh, the Clippers lose or, oh, the Aces lost, like, it's Becky Hammond's name up there. It's Doc Rivers. It's T. Lou. It's not, you know, Natalie Nase. <laughs> so, um, again, it's honestly, it's, it's a day-to-day. -day. For, for me now being so close with Becky, it's like day-to-day. -day. Like, what, what do you need? What can I make, you know, it easier for you? Or, you know, if you need anything offensive and de defensively, how can I help? Because, you know, they just have to have – you know, so much responsibility. And again, for in-game, you know, especially in games, like it's stressful. Like you got to make all the calls, you got to make the shots and you got to, you know, make sure you believe in, in what you see and be confident in what you see. And our first games with Becky, I was like, I was just impressed. I was like, she knows things, she sees things, she's doing it on the fly. And so for me, it was a huge learning curve, you know, to just be able to go up to her and, and communicate with her but then also, like, just see what she saw, like, in timeouts and in huddles. Like, she's, she's one of the best. And, I, and I'm, right. like, just excited to, you know, continue to learn from her and just have this opportunity. Right. Wow. Uh, Coach, can I ask, um, then going with the Clippers, too, yeah. NBA staff is, is a big staff. How do you find your role sometimes as an assistant in that? I know you have to step up and, and you know, do whatever your tasks are and everything, but... To, you have your opinion, you have your voices as an NBA staff. How did, how, especially when you break into it, how do you find your role and, and how did you enjoy that and work your way up? For me, because our, our staff is so big, you know, mm -hmm. it was from either from 15 to 18. Like we had more coaches and uh, players. And so for me, like, especially being younger, 
Um, I kind of wanted to insert myself with kind of with whatever they needed. And so okay. I would be more observant. Uh, I just enjoy like watching people and watching their behavior and watching what they need. And so again, like whenever I felt like I did need to, um, you know, ask what they wanted, then I'll just at the right moments, because it's not, again, if they're stressed and, you know, we're coming off a lot, it's not a good time. So there was moments where I would feel like I could feel Doc's energy or Tilu's energy, like, you know, do you need something at this moment? And so, again, like, um, it was just all about just kind of being aware and just, you know, making, you know, good timely decisions on when, you know, to communicate what was needed, um, but also be ready, you know, like Doc right. and T, like, they're really good at like, hey, what do you see? And like, you, you got to be ready. And for me, like, I love watching film. I mean, if anyone knew me, like I came from video. And so I knew that Doc and Ty's mindset was like elite. And so watching every minute and um, was important. And sometimes I had to watch, they have to watch the game two or three times because listening to Doc and T like after the games or during the games, I'm like, they could script like a hundred possessions like that. And that's impressive. Like. People don't, people who watch from the outside, like, they don't understand, like, really how, like, amazing these guys' minds are. Like, to be able to script back, like, the next day in our meeting, oh, hey, well, you know, so-and-so did this at this time. We have to make sure we correct this or whatever. And I'm like, when did that happen? You know what I mean? I'm like, <laughs> when did that happen? And so, like, I would have to go back and watch, you know, not just once, maybe twice, just to get to their level. And luckily, like, now I'm going into year 11 professionally, like, now I see it, you know, like now I could say like, oh, like, you know, oh, because they played too now. Right. Like they right. played the NBA, so they have way more, you know, reps of seeing it. Becky, she's a Hall of Famer. So like, you know, the things they see, I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, you know, so I can't get enough just kind of being around them and, you know, learning and picking their brain. And that's another thing I would do is like when the moment was right, I would pick their brain, like either text suck or text T, or just, you know, if there's a moment in, in practice or after practice, just hit them with, like, questions. Like, why did you see that? Why did you make this adjustment? And then that's how you learn, you know what I mean? And stay ready for, again, like I said, with whatever they need. Like, just be ready. Right. Wow. And that's awesome. And you, you've worked with some great coaches. And you worked with Bob Hill, I believe, in Japan yeah. also. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, Coach Hill, we're very close to San Antonio down here and, and things. So can you tell us what that experience was like uh, and, and just working with Coach Hill? Intense. Yeah. <laughs> Intense <laughs> the first thing. Um, but, I mean, he's the reason why I want to be in the NBA. I sat in wow. one, of pra one of his practices in Japan, and I'm like, he speaks a completely different language. He – is so detailed in every drill and um, every like play that he explains. So I'm like, oh, I just, I just became obsessed. I was like, oh, I want to know exactly what he knows. And so again, for me, same thing, be aware when time's right, just be ready to ask questions. Um, but again, he, he just had a, a no, like he didn't hold back anything. If he needed to say something or hold someone accountable, he did it instantly. And I think Again, that's what great coaches do. It's like, right. I mean, that's what Becky right. does. She, she calls them out right away just because the game's happening so fast and you have to be able to make adjustments on the fly. And, then, and to go back with that, it's not just about knowing the adjustments. It's about when to do the adjustments. Mm -hmm. And so, again, like learn under Bob. I mean, and he just he accepted me just by, you know, being, you know, like a hooper and a hoop junkie. Like yeah. he was right. after two, he was like, what do you want? I was like, I want to be your assistant, you know, and. <laughs> And he's like, okay. He's like, why not? And so, again, like, he just, he didn't, back then, I was the only female. And so, I got to give credit to him. Like, he didn't see me as a, as a female coach. Like, he just saw me as, you know, a basketball junkie. And so, I mean, I appreciate him for everything he's done, you know. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Um, great coach. And going Fast forward now back to Las Vegas, Coach. I have to ask you about your ATOs, um, your end of the game plays that you guys have. So many good ones. I've I've got some that I stole for our team next year from you guys. Um, that sideline out of bounds to put force it to overtime, Coach. Are those things that Becky draws up, or are they things that um, you practice first and practice the day before, and you're ready, or a combination? Can you kind of? Take us through your ATOs and those last second plays that you guys were so good at. Uh -huh. Well, first for the record, those are hers. 
Um, yeah, okay. Those are yep. hers. Like, yep. she'll ask the assistant coaches, like me, Tyler, and CT, like, if you guys have any suggestions, always send them to me and everything. But at the end of the day, you know, those are hers. I can't take credit. She's got a stack of them um, mm. that she sees. And so that one ATO you're, you're talking about specifically with Jackie Young, um, mm. she drew it. She drew it a couple times in practice. And, you know, funny story is she actually ran it for Asia like a month ago versus Dallas. And, you know, unfortunately, it didn't go our way. But I just remember, like, very vividly, like, this all happened for a reason. You know, like, just, you know, it, it didn't go in. But, right. you know, that happens. Like, that happens. It just doesn't always work. But the play worked, first of all. Yeah. But yeah. Um, she just said, like, you know, the timing, you know, wasn't what it wasn't exact. Chelsea actually threw it a little bit lower than possible. And then um, it just wasn't per it just wasn't perfect. And so. I remember just thinking to myself, like, this all happened for a reason. Because right. now, the next time we do this, this thing is going to work to a T. Because we felt it, right? We felt like we were just one uh, possession away from, you know, winning a game. And so we went back. And she ran a couple times in practice, kind of like um, just as a rep, just like end of the game situations. We run like two-minute uh, games at the end of the game situation. And she'll put either the starters up or down. And then if the moment was right, yeah, she drew it up. But she doesn't like to script too much because um, she, I mean, because you just don't know what exactly the scenario is going to be. Sure. So she doesn't right. like to script it too much, but she did like to introduce it. And so yep. every practice right. she'll go and end a game with, like, a couple of, like, knee twos, knee threes like that. Yep. Um, but when she drew that, when we all looked up and we all saw point eight, we're like, oh, too much time. We're all yep. like, this is too yeah. much time. And Becky's wow. like. This here, here it goes, and we're we're all so excited because you know Seattle, like they already started celebrating, and yeah. I'm like, y'all must have not seen that point eight play that she drew, <laughs> you know? So um, yeah, we were all like, kind of like just kind of laugh, not laughing. I shouldn't say laughing, but we're just like, well, wait for this one, and because I saw her draw it in San Antonio, and I, mm -hmm. and so I went to go visit because we didn't know each other really, mm -hmm. like like really well and so she wanted all the coaches to come visit her in San Antonio before the training camp and the, the game I saw her play pop got ejected and I was like oh this is going to be sweet because I know Becky has head coach you know NBA games before but I'm like oh I get to see this live like, yeah. this is going to be really really you know special and she drew that play like at the end of a quarter and I'm like that thing works <laughs> that thing works every single time so again it's not just you know that she knew it but she knew exactly the moment and she right. knew who to draw it for. She drew a play for Bay, and she drew a play for Asia. And so they had no idea. Like, they thought the play was going to go to KP, yep. and um, she drew it for Jackie. So Yeah. Wow. Coach, that's, that's an awesome story. Just awesome yeah. hearing about it. Um, Coach, can I talk a little bit, ask you about the pick and roll? Being in the NBA, you know, so heavy pick and roll and, and used in the WNBA and college now is more and more, you know, mm -hmm. pick and roll, uh, Spain pick and roll spacing. Can I ask you, being a point guard, coaching such, so many great guards, getting the chance to coach with CP3, coach, can I ask about the point guard reads and just advice for young kids wanting to be good with the ball in their hands and receiving a ball screen and just some teaching points that you like to emphasize? I mean, the biggest, the biggest thing is just getting reps. I mean, because for me, I actually was not a great pick and roll, you know, um, reader mm -hmm. until like – um, just when I played because I was so quick and so I always blew by the defender mm -hmm. um, so that was just me personally but then working obviously with CP like he would break it down and let us know like what he saw what reads he, he would make and I would say like the biggest thing um, with pick and roll is just practicing a lot of reps and just understanding what you're capable of right, right. so right. Um, we've talked about you know in my last uh, podcast I talked about the difference between Kelsey and Chelsea in terms of reading but I think you know looking back and talking about that that Kelsey actually can be an elite passer it's just that she has to see more live pick and rolls and so the biggest thing if you do want to teach your point guards how to do it is just you have to have live play so whether it's mm -hmm. three on three four on four or five on five like get them reps and then from there you'll be able to see like the timing and the spacing um, I would say, because when I watch a lot of like college and high school like drills online, like they do things so scripted, like sure. meaning like sure. the defense is saying, okay, now I'm going to drop. Okay, well, here comes a pocket pass. Like that's not realistic. Yep. So yeah. 
let it go live and let your players make mistakes. And if they turn over the ball, okay, they turn the ball, but they're not trying to turn the ball over. Do you right. know what I'm saying? Right. So, like, mm -hmm. you just got to let them play through mistakes, and then eventually they're going to pass it to the open area and stop, you know, and throwing it into the hands or some, you know, of the defender. Right. So, to me, it's also it's always about reps and putting them in that actual, you know, game experience. But um, I think the reason why CP was, you know, so successful is, number one, he's a willing passer. Yeah. It starts with that. Like, if right. you don't really enjoy passing – like, you're not going to be great at it, right? So you have to have a really selfless act, and that's, you know, across the board from CP, Chelsea Gray, KP. Like, they're all willing passers. Right. And then from there, it's like, you know, now you got to adapt with, okay, well, you got DJ. I mean, you know, then you have Blake. And so, obviously, CP could throw it at the rim for DJ, and then with Blake, you can hit the short roll, you know what right. I mean, for a mid-range. So, I mean – then it's like learning people's strengths in terms of where you can put them in position. So there's no right or wrong of what I could tell you other than like, number one, be a willing passer. And number two, just getting high volume of live reps within it. Right, right. Yeah. I love that coach, especially the live part. You know, so many times you see the practicing, just put a chair out there and, you know, <laughs> I mean, like, with a phone. That's not realistic, you know. Yeah. And, like, yep. and I know coaches love drills. Yeah. But the more I've, you know, worked, especially with, with Becky in training camp, like we just did so much live play. We yeah. just, you know, we let them play. No. And you coach through the live play. Don't yes. stop it. They don't always need to hear your voice. Like like you said, keep it interesting. Yep. Play basketball. Yes. Just let them Love live it. play, you know. Love it. And then a lot of coaches, like one coach actually just asked me, like, well, they don't know what they're doing. Well, teach them. Tell them. Yep. But then let yes. them go through it. You yes. know, let them go through it live, but don't expect them to pick things up right away and, and allow them to make mistakes. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. Love that coach. Uh, coach K says the best teacher of the game is live play, you know, five on five. Love it. Can't go wrong. Can't go wrong R with coach K. Right? Yeah. You can't go wrong with coach <laughs> K. Uh, staying with one more question about the pick and roll um, is if you're involved in a pick and roll or let's say it's Kelsey or Chelsea, um, and the, the ball screen's coming, where do you like to have the other three players? Do you do, you do a two-side, one-side, a, a lift person? Just is there a, a favorite alignment that you guys like to use with, with your pick and rolls? I mean, flat would be ideal because then mm. they're all out of the way in terms yeah. of like for Chelsea, we have to flatten it out because we know Chelsea's a master at the mid-range. So, again, it's mm. all personnel-driven. Sure. You know, we're like, plum, she can get downhill. So we'd probably want to clear out – as, well, shoot, we would love to just clear out the strong, whole strong side and lift and put everyone on the opposite side. You know, that'd be mm -hmm. ideal because then she can just get downhill and then make the reads actually with her left. So we would make the reads, put all the people on her right side. So it's personnel driven. You have to know, you know, the strengths of the ball handler. Um, but, you know, get just beyond that three. You better get beyond that three because, yeah. you know, we're going to get mad if you're defending our own pick and roll. And then right. at the end of the day, like, Simple is the best. So, again, yep. if you see two or someone, for some reason, the dub, they, they helped off strong corner. I don't know, you know, why, but yep. they did. And um, if you see that strong corner help off, pass it. It doesn't have to be the, the beautiful pocket, the, you know, split right. the defense. Kelsey's got that behind the back down. She's got the over the head. Like, <laughs> right. it could be that if she wants, you know, but sometimes just that corner three to Jackie Young, hey, I'm taking that all day. Right, so, right. Yeah. Coach, I, I I don't want to say yell, but I have to tell our guys a lot. Don't help strong side corner. Don't, don't help, help strong side corner. Like, uh, you're giving up that, threes. It's crazy. Yeah, it's like, crazy. But we were like, okay, we'll take yeah. it. So yeah. we didn't, you know, want to say anything other than thank you. So <laughs> Right. Coach, this has been so great. I have a few more questions. I just can't yeah. thank you enough for taking the time for this. Uh, yeah. My next question is just about going from a, a, a very good Division One player um, when they make that jump to the WNBA. And I guess uh, the other question I have is, 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 is another loaded question, but uh, when you guys are looking at your roster, and I know you have a GM who takes care of all that, but just when you're looking at players, does it help to have players from winning programs? Like, you know, if you get someone from UConn or you get someone from South Carolina, you know, um, like AJ, do, do you guys, does that make a difference? And then my other question is just, um, rookies in the WNBA what's what's kind of the biggest learning curve for them to jump from high level division one but now the WNBA well to answer your first question um I mean the 
the beauty of like Asia coming, you know, from Dawn, I mean, her, her discipline and her competitive edge and her willing to um, be open to like different, you know, again, we introduced such a different offense and defense. Like that on top of her competitive drive, I mean, that definitely had to, you know, partly come from Dawn. I mean, she's, she's a beast. But we don't really see it. We don't always see it that way. And all, obviously because we can't have top 12 players come from the same school, you know, or from, come from the top schools. And that's okay. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, not everyone gets to be chosen as an elite, you know, um, UConn, uh, Stanford, or, right. you know, UCLA. I'll just throw that in there while I'm on. <laughs> there you go. Plug for um, your school. But it's more like, you know, you don't want 12 elite players. You have to have players that understand their role. You're going to have to have players that – um, defend and um, you know rebound and do the little things like you can't have 12 scores so so to answer your question you know no but what we do look for is selflessness like they got to be a selfless player you know and then um, skill wise Becky was like they got to be able to make a three so yeah. that yeah. was uh, that was a requirement yeah. and then yeah. um, in terms of uh, I think for just being a pro is that you have to be disciplined. You know, you got to be able to handle your business outside off the court uh, because right. when you come on this court, like it's going to be a grind. Like you're going to, you're going to have to be able to work hard and be able to compete at a high level. So for me, it's, you know, it's that discipline factor. And so again, credit to whatever coach, you know, they come from and usually most college coaches do a great job. And so we never right. really have a problem with that. Right. Right. Yeah. That's good, Coach. And then with a rookie adjustment, I mean, it's hard as any rookie, unless you're extremely, you know, one of the the, the best ones, to exactly. to play a lot or get in the rotation. Is there something that just takes it? Is it the speed, the size of the WNBA game? Do you think what's the biggest adjustment for not every rookie, but just maybe most rookies to get adjusted to? Well, I think you mentioned it. it's the si the size and the speed, like you said. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's natural. Just yeah, they went through from high school to college, and then yep. college to pro, it always goes up. But I think the biggest thing um, is understanding, like, they're not the star anymore. You yeah. know, like, I mean, our, we had mm. great rookies. Yeah. We had, you know, KB and we had Asia Shepard who were elite players on their team. Yeah. And so yeah. they were, you know, they understood, like, they had elite, you know, vets and starters and, you know, talented players up in front of them. But they also wanted to play, you know, at the end right. of the day. Right. So what we did and we took this, um, you know, from the NBA is, like, we – we played a lot. So we called them like the stay ready games. And so when we we're at home, we would have our scout guys come and we would have like five or six guys play pickup with our second unit. And that helped a ton. Like they just, because then, like I said, you want to play live. Like yeah. drills are not going to keep these players ready. You know what I mean? Like three on three is not always going to work. And so anytime we we're at home, uh, we got the guys and we played like four quarters. We had four quarters of either five minutes we like to like we like to simulate a, a stint, and so an average okay. stint is okay. like three to four minutes, or even two to three, and then just go hard, and then do four quarters like an actual game, and you know they loved it. And then anytime their name their number was called, like Teresa TP, she was she had to play when Jackie Young was out, so she was ready, and she we won games when she started. And then yep. same yep. thing with KB. I mean KB went from not playing at all, and then we threw her into the Seattle game you know, away on Sue's, like, that was, like, Sue's supposedly, like, last regular season game at home. And she went in there, and she just played, like, ridiculously hard and made, you know, big plays. And so it's, like, um, that was the biggest adjustment for them. But, again, we try to, like, make it as realistic as possible to keep them, you know, playing as much as they can. So if college, yep. you know, coaches hear this or high school coaches, like, make sure your players are not playing. Play them in practice. Right. You know, get them right. some reps. You play. You know, I mean, yep. sometimes I had to play. Yeah. I had my butt kick. But, yeah. you know, I tried my hardest. But, you yeah. know, they would, they would kill me. But, you know, keep them, Coach, keep them ready. Yeah. I love that. The stay ready games. I mean, that's, that's such a cool concept. Can I ask real quick, going then back to the NBA, what does that look like in the NBA? Who would, you know, how does that a stay ready game in the NBA look? What, what does that look like? It's this, I mean, it's exactly the same, same how thing. I just said it. Yeah. yeah. Like people. She just, was came back from an injury two years mm -hmm. ago, and mm -hmm. so yeah, I mean we played probably ten ga ten days straight of him just playing because we he wanted to make back, sure yeah. like when he was ready to play like yep. it wasn't yep. like oh let's 
recondition you during the yeah. game. No, like yeah. Pete wanted to be ready, you know, as soon as it counted. And that's why I, I don't know if you guys remember, but he just killed that two years ago when, when he came back and he yep. just like everyone's like, What was he doing? And it's like well, staying ready. Like Stay ready staying. games. And yeah. again, credit to our the guys that don't play, the second unit guys of like like T Man was like going at him like yeah he had this yes. whole thing yeah. like he ain't gonna score on me amir coffee was like oh he's not gonna score on me you know so the games got super competitive and again credit to those guys because they got you know pg ready so yeah yeah it's, yeah. A, it's the same concept that's, yeah. that's so cool coach the stay ready games and uh last question coach i just got to ask did you watch your you, you had three players from the aces just win the cup so what a what a few weeks you know for those <laughs> players coach i mean two championships within a month i mean what else could they what else do they want to win you know what i mean yeah. like if you had a freaking fly to mars right now they'd probably <laughs> take a spaceship and fly and dominate i mean i when we came back on the plane i mean i you know was so gone they're like coach we were leaving in two days i was like where are you going and right. they're right. like australia and i'm like we just played you guys because we only sometimes rotated six and so, the, okay. like, Asia okay. played 40 minutes, like, I would say more than half of the playoff games. And so I'm thinking she's going to go home, sleep, rest, you know, go on vacation. No, they had to take a flight to Australia. Then I turn on the TV, and they're starting. I was right. like, what uh, yeah. is going on? Like, right. this is unbelievable. And so just, like, to put this out there, like, credit to them. Like, that is unheard of. Like, in the NBA, that's actually not how it – actually works like most of the right. guys like like the top guys don't go over right away or they wait till the year before the olympics mm -hmm. you know what i mean like they yep. don't yep. go every year like how the women do and so yeah that's why i was so confused i'm like why are you guys going because normally this is how we do it and they're like this is not how the w does it and i'm like <laughs> this might have to be something that i have to yeah. you know because yeah. i was con you know just concerned I'm yeah a concerned coach, sure. and so i'm like a yep. parent like i don't want you guys yeah. to get hurt yeah. and you know yada yada but I mean, look what they did. Like, look what they did. It, and look what they uh, did. Yeah. Didn't it, it was spectacular. Yeah. yeah, it was just in yeah. Asia, did the MVP. Watch? Yes, at, at late nights. But the, uh, the MVP of it and, you know, and, and just for like KP coming back from the knee injury 2020 for all that she has won these two years and just so special, Coach. And I know, yeah, you guys just had to be loving life. Yeah, I mean, After. KP coming from an Achilles tear, like mm. – that, to, right, like once Kobe did it and before Kobe did it, like that was unheard of, yep. right? No one comes back yes. from the Achilles. Nobody. And like, look what yeah. she's doing. Yeah. And she's, you know, she's she's smaller. And she's yeah. getting in there feisty. And I remember just the final game, and I filmed it because I was like, why are you doing it? But she's diving on the floor. Diving right? on the so floor. I saw it too, like, Coach. Yeah. what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. do not do that. Yeah. Like. The game's yes. over, but that's who she is, and that's right. a lot of reasons of why we won a lot of games was because of yes. her tenacity, her, like, I don't give a f like, I'm yep. going after yep. it. And so, yep. you know, God, credit yeah. to her. Like, yeah. she's she's amazing. She's yeah. a huge yeah. piece of why we won. Sure. Oh, of course, uh, Coach, uh, your whole team. Just congratulations. Last last thing, just, Coach, just for our listeners, um, I'm not sure how WNBA works with open practices in your preseason or anything like that, but obviously so many people would love to to get out there. And you could make a, a two a two for a trip because UNLV women's basketball is awesome. You can go watch Coach Lindy, who's been on this podcast, and then maybe sometime come over and watch the Aces. Is that something that, you know, maybe in the preseason or something that that's possible for coaches to watch? Yeah, I mean, I think that's going to be a Becky Hammond question, but I think okay. that'd be yeah. Hope, but yeah, like I'm pretty sure she would. You know, I don't want to speak a hundred. I don't want to. Sure, speak 100 I understand. So, but we've had yeah. um, coaches that were in the area. Yeah, yeah we open up. I think what we do do is we close during playoffs. So that's sure, that's of course. Yeah. yeah. Well, Coach, uh, this has been wonderful, and I just you drop so much knowledge and so many great stories, and I just want to say one more time thank you, and also just congratulations. I'm sure you have another party to attend to when you go back <laughs> and see your family in L.A., but just enjoy it all, and then we just can't wait to turn on the TV and, and see you guys back at it. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it, and yeah, we better run it back. We had yeah. it. We got to yeah. run it back, so thank you. Thanks for having me. Yes, thank you so much, Coach. Wow. Uh, just a wonderful uh, stories tonight. Great listening to Coach. Uh, we want to thank her again for coming on the podcast. And then I want to thank my producer, Jude McLaren, who makes all this possible. And our sponsors right here in San Marcos, Pie Society. 
uh, excellent stop. Go grab some pizza, grab some beer. Um, and then, of course, Zelix Ice House, another great place to go visit and have a good time with your friends. Thank you again for watching Basketball and Brew podcast. And until next time, enjoy the basketball.